Good day to all of you and welcome to another fabulous weekend of webinars. We've been going through different topics in the past four months and we've had some outstanding presenters. We've had topics that are practical. We have topics that are controversial, topics that are useful on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, topics that are fundamental and topics that are very advanced. So now we've come to a point where we need to take some um, firm decisions as to how to prepare our offices uh, now that the pandemic has its own course. And even though it has paralyzed our lives, we still need to make ways and means to overcome these hurdles and allow ourselves to help our patients and equip ourselves in a way that it's going to be safe and effective for everybody around us. Uh, our staff is a priority, our patients' health and well-being certainly is a priority, and above all, we go back to our families, and that also needs to be considered. About six to seven weeks ago, there was a webinar that we launched, which did evoke a lot of interest, uh, both you know, in terms of controversy, in terms of ruffling some feathers, and you see where we are now. It's about eight weeks since that webinar was released, and today we are at a stage where we feel fairly confident to be able to handle our patients in a manner that is going to protect all of us. So let's look at the perspective in the US so that you get an idea of how it is in the hot spot of the world. Could you imagine the United States getting over 3 million cases and over 130,000 deaths? And that's probably the highest any country has seen and within each state is surpassing the numbers that we see in most of the countries in Europe. It's especially the one that I am practicing in. Around the time when we were giving the webinar, we were really very, very high. The per day uh, positive cases were running in the thousands. We had four or five thousands per day that were diagnosed and more than 10,000 deaths have been reported thus far. And look where we are today. It's about July 12th, and we are averaging at the rate of about 350 a day, which seems to be digestible. And most of our establishments have opened. We have phased opening. We are in phase four, and that's been put on hold. So most of the malls are still open. Uh, the restaurants are open, except that you have to be outdoor. Uh, most of the practices are in full swing, and there is some lessons to be learned from all of this. One thing, whether it is airborne or whether it is droplet nuclei, you, you, we, we can debate this ad nauseum. The truth of the matter is distancing works. You can see this alarming rate of increase in many other states where they have completely ignored the distancing. New Jersey was mocked upon along with New York for not taking care of itself. Our governor implemented measures to make sure that we always wore masks in public, um, though many people don't believe in masks, but the proof is in the pudding. You could see the value of social distancing, and this is what we are implementing in our practices in the US. And look at a state which has completely ignored social distancing. We are now looking at an alarming rate of about 11,000 cases a day. What the whole country did not see, Florida alone is seeing 11,000 cases a day. They are overwhelming the hospitals, the ERs are almost full, the ICU units cannot take any more new patients. So we can learn from all of these lessons and it doesn't take rocket science to bring in fancy equipment to uh, prove the statisticians that this is one of the factors that's causing a decrease in the rate of uh, COVID exposure. Now we can say that we are in the United States, we have a lot of testing. What about countries in Asia? You see that we have a variety of approaches that we are taking and um, we need to kind of look at what has worked successfully in some of these practices and how we can learn 
from transmitting this information across to most of our practices so we can also benefit from the utilization of successful protocols. To elaborate this, we couldn't find a better tandem pair, the mother and son uh, team that we have assembled here. Uh, they are known for their diligence. They are known for their work ethics. And I've personally worked with both of them for over 20 years. Uh, Varun is uh, like my mentee who I have uh, groomed over all these years. And I'm really proud to see him successful as a prosthodontist, as an implantologist, and as a technologist. Uh, we also would be mightily surprised to see the review guy coming up with a lot of these reviews for prosthodontics. And of course, everybody knows Dr. Vijayalakshmi Acharya. She is the doyen of modern dentistry. She was probably one of the pioneers in implant dentistry in Chennai. Uh, Professor Branham uh, was there at her practice and uh, you don't need any introduction for her. Uh, her work speaks for itself, her uh, work ethics, her uh, talent, attests for all of the uh, accolades that she has received over the decades that she's been in practice. Uh, this is perhaps one of the finest practices, practices in India. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Vijayalakshmi Acharya to uh, show us all how she has implemented some of the safe protocols along with her son, Varuna Acharya. Without further ado, Dr. Acharya, the podium is all yours. Good evening, good evening to our friends in the dental world. Good evening, Dr. Shankar Ayer. It is wonderful to be able to be present to present on this prestigious platform of the Smile USA. Thank you, Doctor, so much for inviting us. You have been our guide all these years, and today you are the moderator for our session. This is a singular honor. I hope uh, everyone can see the screen. Yeah. Can the, uh, is the uh, screen visible to all, Dr. Ayer? Yeah, we can all see the screen, and uh, Mom's screen is also very clear. Okay. I've already spoken. I think you need to advance the slide, Doctor. Yeah. So, enter the dragon, the novel coronavirus, the likes of which mankind has not seen before, which today has brought dentistry to its knees, at least for now. The world is trying to make a vaccine, but it is not yet ready. It is obvious our work is risky and our profession is at risk. We live in an atmosphere of rotary equipment, spewing, swirling mists of aerosol made of saliva, blood, contaminated water and dangerous chemicals. Until now, we have come out reasonably unscathed. The question we all ask ourselves today is, how will we safely treat our patients as well as ensure our safety at this time? The decisions we need to take are based upon evidence and research. Our life depends on it. Today, we take pleasure in sharing with you exactly what we do in our clinic as well as what we do not do. We hope to reach out to all types of practices, those just starting out, small and large setups and established ones. So now the question is, why work? Why work at all? You know, most dentists, we are quite well off. We don't really need to work. And everybody is talking about this work-life balance. We are always guilty in our professions as probably working more and not spending time on the other, the other half, equally important part of our life. But why work when this is heavily skewed now to the left, with even a risk of loss of life because of this work? So this question may, will be asked by many of our friends and families telling you not to work because it is too risky. Of course, the panic comes from the unknown. For us, the reasons are clear. Uh, a dental clinic, you know, what we have, you know, we are dentists, of course, you know, we don't have that much adulation as doctors do, but we have responsibilities. The first responsibility we have is our responsibility to patients. You know, what will happen if we don't, don't at all attend to our patients and we stay at home? 
apart from the fact that we will we will be like totally at a loss as what what we're going to do if you are not going to work we feel kind of guilty because the first responsibility we have is towards our patients so a dental clinic is a very controlled environment and you and i know that even before covid came it's a very controlled environment we are, but here we are now screening the patients but just imagine we send our patients to a hospital then the chance of direct contact with covid 19 patients some healthcare workers also it increases the burden on hospital dental departments and we have to be aware of that and of course we need to keep our hippocrates oath in mind what does it say it says you have to treat the ill with the best of one's ability so you know we have a responsibility to staff as well what about the staff who work for us for years on end us what about time they actually live you know how we live in very few clinics can afford to pay salaries without doing all procedures and we know about our employees they all work because it's necessary to work it's necessary for their families so these employees live from paycheck to paycheck and this can come only when we do elective procedures i'm sure you will agree with me on that so what about the responsibility to the practice itself we tried it you know one month we didn't go to work at all that was from march 22nd up till the end of april we didn't know because we didn't go because we didn't know enough and we didn't dare to go there and so everybody had shut so we shut when we came back to the practice you won't believe all the things that had gone wrong i couldn't believe it the plumbing the machinery the equipment everything was like just not working some tap had gone rusty not not rusty it was just blocked some plumbing lines were like in a mess so something water was leaking somewhere there were pests some pests were some cockroach was running around i couldn't believe it that we could also get there were gas leaks some electrical problems so all these things that had risk to our carefully sort of our carefully set up office all these will be just from what we call disuse atrophy i guess that's a good dental word to use and all our uh, amc and the contracts all of that had been expired and nobody would be willing to even look after these uh, these equipment for us because they say oh it's already gone and th this was the big financial hit we took plus all the shock of seeing our clinic just falling apart and the other thing you know it was always in the back of the month my mind i have to be honest in the month of april i was worrying about one thing i was worrying about all the patients who were going to leave my practice you know i have been very jealously guarding my patients it's so difficult to get one patient into the practice and they are on all generations and i'm proud of saying i like to have patients for every i want this patient whom you see this gentleman not just his children i want his father his grandfather and hopefully i'm going to see his grandchildren so to keep this one person in the practice it means keeping his family in the practice and if we are not going to be there for him when he needs us i think we probably lose him because the day he is in distress when he calls if we are not there they may go to another practice and as i told you i jealously guard my patients i like i like to also look after them and at the same time i want to keep them in the practice because goodwill it's a very important component of this exercise of keeping people in practice everyone remembers you were available in times of need so we decided to get into this practice we said no this we have to do you know we have so many accounts of so many things we feel sort of guilty so we will just go by guidelines so we started thinking about how to what what guidelines to follow because you know it's quite daunting when the, the beginning we were just like overwhelmed with the amount of guidelines we got we didn't know there was a road on which to travel we had we had guidelines coming from the center for disease control we had from the american dental association we had from the who was every day reversing whatever they were saying one day then we had from the dental council of india state dental councils everybody were putting their best foot forward to get us the best guidelines but at the end of it we ended up all very confused what to do so how did we decide how did we decide we actually decided we decided to follow guidelines of course but we decided to follow guidelines which were evidence based we tried to follow guidelines which were practical which were repeatable something that was sustainable that we could do again and again and something most important it should be cost effective and 
I must tell you, we avoided guidelines. Certain guidelines we avoided. And which was those? We avoided guidelines which were just a hypothesis, something that came on WhatsApp, something somebody said. We also avoided guidelines which were kind of pseudo-scientific or very expensive or very uncomfortable, that it was too, too difficult to do. And something that was also environmentally unsafe. So if in some cases, what happened was, if there was some weak evidence, we implement, implemented it as long as it was not prohibitively expensive or imp impractical to implement. So we devised, we saw a practical protocol. So if you look at this protocol, if you see this inverted pyramid on the top of the list, from the most effective to the most, to the least effective protocol, this is how we prioritized everything. We prioritized, we know very well that the first thing in, 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 help, in protecting everything, the most effective form would be eliminate. So what is this eliminating? We wanted, wanted to completely eliminate exposure to the hazard. That is the most effective control. Then we could substitute. The other protocol is that we could, the next, the next most effective, if you want to call it that, was to substitute. So we could replace these hazards with a non-hazardous object, but this is not practical in dentistry. So what to do? We also knew that there were some engineering controls which had to come into place. The engineering controls, we could isolate the person from hazard through physical or mechanical means. And administrative controls changes the way we make to the way people work. So the personal protective equipment is worn by people to protect themselves from real or potential hazards like gloves and lab coats, safety glasses and etc. And of course, the community protective equipment, which is to be worn by a person to prevent community spread. This is the last line of defense and that effectiveness depends on the community use and their ability to adopt all this. So we first addressed elimination. This, pros this prospect of elimination, what exactly was it? We know it is the most effective control because you're completely eliminating exposure to the hazard. So before even the patient comes in, we can try to start thinking about how to eliminate that hazard. So of course, you all know, and we are all doing this. We call patients beforehand. We refer the doctor after the telephone operator starts talking, then the doctor also talks, and then we send these forms. The, the patient talks to the doctor on the phone, and then WhatsApp, through WhatsApp, we communicate with them. And for this, we had, in the beginning, we devised a sort of Acharya dental form, if you would like to call it that, because we, the guidelines came from the forms which they had to fill, which were sent to them subsequently. Like before, during the scheduling, we would ask them, the patients were asked whether they were having any cough or cold or some fever or they were unwell and they needed to postpone. And then we had to ask them whether, you know, they had any contact with anybody, you know, who has, who had tested positive or if they were awaiting a positive result. Or if they were awaiting a result of, uh, awaiting a result of COVID result, positive or negative, whatever. And if whatever they were planning to do and the reason for why they were coming in, was it for emergency or some routine thing? So this was the first part of it. Then we also told them in the form that there would be some kind of um, some kind of protocol that we follow. Like there would be uh, they would require to do some hand wash, and that when they came to the reception desk, we would be checking them out. And there would be a triage that they would have to have a mask when they come in, and on arrive and they have to arrive a little bit before time. And if there was somebody else waiting and there were too many people waiting, there might be some wait time. Because now you know the procedures we do, which we did before in 15 minutes, now it takes 45 because of all the preparation we have to do between rooms and so on. So now we also told them a little bit, not too much because the forms were going in, whether the attenders, the accessories, that they should not have too many people come along with them. If possible, they should come alone not to wear much accessories. You know, in India, we like jewelry. But then we wanted to ask them to minimize that. And uh, that we also had a washroom, but to try not to use it and to do what they had to do at home and, you know, try to avoid using washroom in case of cross-contamination. 
We also told them one thing that, yeah, there might be some extra charges. There will be extra charges because of all the equipment that we are having to wear, of all the personal protective equipment, and uh, to make payments as much as possible cashless. So with this much, we went ahead and then finally we sent them this form. So this form is there, it's available in a handout. So you can get this and you can just send this by WhatsApp prior to the patient coming in. And kudos to the Indian Dental Association. They made life so much easier for us. In a little bit of a small item here, if you look at item number nine, I verify the information I have provided on this form is truthful and accurate. I knowingly and willingly consent to treatment completed during the COVID-19 pandemic. If I hide my facts and relevant details, and because of my knowing or unknowing behavior or action, the clinic staff gets infected, I may be held responsible for appropriate con compensation in the court of law. This is actually something meant to deter a patient from coming if they did have anything. In fact, one patient objected. He says, why should I sign this? I'm not interested in this. This is like, you, what do you mean to say? Do you think I will be lying about all this? So we politely told him, no, we know you're not, you will not be lying about it. But we just want to warn you that, you know, in case you forget to tell us some detail that somebody in your house was having a problem, then, you know, we have a problem and this is for everybody's protection. And we had to pacify him. But I thank God for the Indian Dental Association who made this little disclaimer, a little, little, little piece of advice to the patient, a small threat, not that we are going to do it, but still. So the other thing was substitution. So what was in substitution? You know, in that, in that, uh, you know, from the hierarchy, from the most important to the less to the third in the list, this is the substitution. It is actually to replace the hazard with a non-hazardous object, device, or substance. In dentistry, this means avoid aerosol. Do you think this is possible? I don't know. This is impossible at the moment. Who knows about technology in the future? But right now, aerosols, aerosols are a part of our life and we have to do it so we cannot really substitute. And then we move on to engineering and administrative control. So what is this? So the engineering control is actually when you isolate the person from the hazard or from, the, from whatever you think is going to affect this person, the hazard as we talk in this case, the coronavirus, it is, we have to engineer or isolate the person, whoever is dealing with it through physical or mechanical means. The other one is to change the way that people work. So we have to bring in those changes into our office and that's exactly what we did in our clinic. So here are the people, the mask on arrival, all our staff have to have a mask. So the mask is mandatory on arrival. It has to be worn at all times without exception. Because of the large numbers of our staff, we stagger their arrival time. So this is the queue waiting to get in to undergo mandatory triage before they enter the clinic. They are waiting patiently because everybody has to go one by one. They have to wash their hands and you will see now further what next. The doctors do the same. All of us will be waiting in that queue. So that is why we stagger our timings. And if you look at this picture very closely, you will see that this is, this is a special one rack for doctor's footwear only. So we don't, we don't ask a patient, neither we, we all have, when it comes to thinking, okay, we have to wear footwear for the clinic. So we change our street footwear and we have special footwear. These are all the street footwear you see. We have special footwear and then how to touch that footwear. So in the beginning, I used to keep tissue paper where you know, you see this little box here. In the beginning, I used to keep tissue paper there to hold the shoe, to put on our clinic footwear and then do that. And then stingy as I am, and I like to admit it, in this case, we cut up some old newspaper and put it into that tissue box so that we could just pick a piece of newspaper, hold the shoe, and then put on our shoe and then discard the paper. The other thing which we did, which was also like, like, like frugal living, if you like to say that, is actually we use a lot of recycled paper. It is available in huge rolls in the paper mart. What you can do is instead of putting these face tissues, these tissues which come in these boxes are extremely expensive. A huge roll of recycled paper is about 300 rupees. It's a very, very small sum of money and we use tons of it. 
to wipe hands, to wipe surfaces, to do everything. So I found out that we could save a lot of money by using recycled paper, except where one needed to wipe the face. And that nowadays hardly happens. The face is after all behind the mask. So then, moving on, we also told the nurses, they all wear this kind of footwear. They also have, they come and change, they do the same thing. They wear shoes. So what we do now for what we recommend and what we like is, is this closed kind of shoe. This closed toe shoe is kind of ideal. It's made, you can get it, it's made out of rubber and it can be sanitized easily. So now with, because of the introduction of this, we are now saving on shoe covers in the clinic. So that is one big saving we have because we just use this and we use this only in the clinic. We remove it before we go home. So it never gets exposed to anything. So if you like, you can use shoe covers. It makes you comfortable, but it's not truly necessary. So moving on to our story of the people who are waiting in the queue to get in, whether it's a patient, whether it's a staff, whether anybody, whoever goes in even comes in for a second time, they have to get past this gentleman, this poor, poor guy. He stands here to just guide these people to go to the hand washing section. So the hand washing, every the hand washing instructions are displayed very, very prominently. So just under the faucet, it is there to tell you how is the right way to wash your hands. I need not elaborate. We as dentists know we've been through this ad nauseum, but it's nice to have it a little bit of card, a card outside there, just telling them, don't forget, don't forget, please, please wash your hands. This is the way, spend some time, press fingertips, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then moving on on this journey from the outside of the clinic, slowly making our way to before you enter the office. So before they enter this office, we have this receptionist who sits outside the clinic and maintains a logbook. This is required by the government because tomorrow if there's any case tested positive, they will need to track who are the people who came in. So this is required by the government. And what we have told this lady is we, gave her a pair of protective glasses. They are just plain uh, non-prescription glasses. We gave her a fan because it's very, very hot in Chennai. You have to sit out there. And we also gave her uh, some things which I will now elaborate later. You know, you can make this lady sit outside, but what about smaller clinics, for instance? So in a smaller clinic, which is just about one or two operatories, and there's an elevator and it's placed on the first floor of some building, what could be done is if you can see that little desk with a red marking there, just on the inside of the door, away from the reception staff, this patient, the, the patients can be processed for the triage. So this also works very well, and that's fine because we have to actually make two in the areas that we have in the cleverest way possible. So what is the tray that she has in front of her? If you look at that tray, it contains a non-contact sensor thermometer. It also contains... Um, it contains two uh, pulse oximeters there. Why does it contain two? In fact, we have two uh, thermometers as well. Because one day we found out that this readings from these thermometers can sometimes turn up faulty. We had a patient who came in who showed it was getting 99 degrees. She, she looked she had like she had 99 degrees uh, the temperature. And we immediately, everybody was alarmed. We went out there. We took another, another machine and we did it and she was like normal. So it's good to have a backup sensor, uh, sensor uh, thermometer, non-touch uh, non thermometer, uh, and also good to have two of these pulse oximeters because they also get faulty very easily. Of course, there's a sanitizer. This is my recycled paper inside this box, for uh, which has been cut up and kept there. And the patient sanitizes their hand and they enter the operatory. You can see when they enter the operatory, the, the, the front desk, they're also socially distanced. They're, they're actually quite far away from each other. So there is no, uh, they also wear masks and they either wear prescription glasses or protective glasses. Everywhere in the clinic, in the front desk, we have all of these posters, the right way to wash your hands and the symptoms of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. You can actually, these information posters, they're actually mandatory. And they can be there, they have been shared in all the handouts that we are going to give you. So if you look at the reception, you can see everybody is sitting at quite a quite a long distance from each other. And we have actually, since the reception is quite large, we've been able to be accommodate a maximum of five or six people or seven people at the most. And then we start getting nervous. 
So why do we why do we keep them? You know, people are coming from families. Why do they keep? Why do we try to spread them out as much as possible? We just want to have visual control to make sure that the numbers are not exceeding and the people are not getting uncomfortably close to each other. Because suppose somebody is coming in and there are too many people in the room, we can always tell them to wait out in the car till they can be called in. We have to do that very politely. Sometimes it does happen. Or if you have a small waiting area, this could happen. In a waiting area such as this, you see on the uh, to the left, uh, to, uh, you see in this, maybe a maximum of two or three people can wait at a time, not more than that. Maybe two people would be ideal. So we have to be very careful with the social distancing because like Dr. Iyer told you, social distancing and wearing this mask is really critical to the whole COVID story. It can actually reduce numbers. So then we have this fancy equipment. You know, I was, I, 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 we have this air purifier in the corner of our waiting room. It's a fancy looking uh, air purifier is from Dyson. Note that this is a room air purifier. This is not indicated for hospital environment. And that's why it's in our waiting area. We did not go out and buy this. I told you, you know, I'm very frugal and trying very hard to save money. I didn't have it, didn't go out to buy it. But it so happened we had it available. It was in my house, barely used in my house by anybody. Somebody brought, my, my, my older son, Varun's elder brother, he brought it and, and he kept it there and we never switched it on. And one fine day, I said, hey, what is this doing here? And we brought it here. So we decided to place it in the clinic as an impressive addition to the waiting room. A little bit of showmanship, I suppose. I don't know. Anyway, we also keep windows open. As per the regulation, this helps cool the air additionally. This air purifier, it's a little cooler when we keep it on. We are also using the air conditioning in that clinic. And about the billing. So this billing part, you know, everyone has, a, we do not like cash, obviously, for obvious reasons. If somebody does bring in cash, we've already told them on that form not to bring cash, but still sometimes people do bring it in. We can't avoid it. So what do we do? If the cash is given, it is handled with gloves. It's placed in a box and we deal with it a few days later. If you're in a rush for that cash, you can actually iron your cash. That's a little extreme, but that's the only way to go about it. So we prefer payment solutions like Google Pay or Paytm, et cetera. And the credit card, if that is given, it is sanitized with a hand sanitizer. So, you know, what is this? Actually, if you look at all the risks, our operatories are very safe. The real risk actually is, and evidence shows it, the real risk is where the common areas, where the people, our staff, and all of that aggregate. They are at great risk because these people, when they come into these areas, they have let their guard down. Their guard down. What do they do? They sit together, they chat, they talk. The mask is off because they're eating. And they aggregate, they tend to aggregate. So this is the most anecdotal reports of disease transmission have been linked to these areas of congregation. And this is where we have to be super careful, even more than probably our operatories, where all our protocols are in place. Here, we don't have much control. So how did we control this? The controls we did was in our waiting, in our dining area, we told people that you have to, we staggered all the lunch times. We gave different people different timings to eat. And there's nobody was ex allowed to sit opposite each other. They had to eat within 10 or 15 minutes and leave and make way for the next lot of people. And of course, we discouraged talking as far as we possible. And this is the same thing we did in the doctor's office, the same thing. If you see the doctor's office, it's exactly the same. They are far away, but they look sort of happy, but they are distanced. So now moving on to disinfection. So what is disinfection? What are we doing? Disinfection is actually defined as a procedure, the result of which is transient, and that eliminates and kills microorganisms or deactivates undesirable viruses that are carried by contaminated environment. And there are three levels of this, high, intermediate, and low. So the chemicals which we most frequently used are, are use are quaternary ammonium compounds, 0.1 to 2%, chlorine compounds, 0.01 to 5%, 
Alcohol compounds 0.5 to 1 percent, alcohol 70 to 95 percent, and sometimes we decontaminate. Decontamination can be done with formaldehyde. So this is a very useful tool. It, it is called List N by the Environmental Protection Agency. This lists all the recognized disinfectants which are effective for emerging pathogens such as the novel coronavirus. It also mentions contact time and pays special attention to this. The current version of this list is available as a PDF handout. So we started in the beginning using a lot of sodium hypochlorite. We, it was recommended 1% for floor mopping and 0.5% for impression and processing. And we found out that we need like two cans or three cans a day. The hypochlorite was expensive and smelly. We were using large quantities of this stuff and the mixing of it was a problem. We had to be very careful for mixing in case it was splashing. We ruined a few uniforms with this, with this hypochlorite splashing all over the place. And so we moved on. So we switched to plain old fashioned, old fashioned Lysol, which is also equally effective. So after we finish with the patient, we open the doors, the windows, and the same assistants will begin to clean the room. And then we start mopping the floor. This is how we do it. So if you look, every room, every operatory has these three essential ingredients. We always label these things because we are reusing bottles. So what are the three things? It's like the kitchen, hypo, fluoride solution, soap, and sanitizer. So we use a hypochlorite solution to sanitize our impressions before washing them. So we dribble the hypochlorite solution 0.5 to 1.1%, 0.5 to 1% on the impression so that it is moistened. Then we wait for one minute and then wash if needed. And we then did also what is called surface disinfection. So what is our surface disinfection protocol? So this surface disinfection applies to expensive furniture, machinery, share up, chair upholstery, and keyboards. So this product called Acrocept, these are things which we are actually using, so I wanted to share with you. So Acrocept is a little bit more expensive. Actually, it is dichlorocyanurate. So this becomes hypochlorous acid when dissolved in water. So the Acrocept has to be mixed fresh every time or it becomes salt and active chlorine ions are lost. So what we did is we moved from there to what is called D125. It is slightly cheaper. It's a quaternary ammonium compound. It has got a big advantage because if it is kept in an airtight container, it can be diluted and stored for 30 days. So we thought this was better and we moved on to D125, the quaternary ammonium compound, which is very freely available. And then what did we do? We used clean film like this to make it easy to disinfect. We, we knew we could not be disinfecting between all these keys of the keyboard and so on. So we just used clean, clean film to make it easy to disinfect. I have a little bit of a, of a kind of guilty conscious that here now I started to use cling film. We were actually moving away from plastics and, you know, and disposing and then putting all those things into the ocean and contaminating the environment. After all that, I have a little bit of guilt about it, but we have no, I have no choice. We don't change the cling film every day, but we did put it on all these so that it is easy to disinfect the keyboard. And if you look at the right, the one good thing that COVID did for our practice is uh, eliminate the spittoon. So all these years, I used to hear that people work without spittoons and it's completely, you know, like 400 dentistry and nobody's uses a spittoon. But I know so many practices and all dental chairs come with spittoons. And I found to my shock and surprise that even when we are doing aerosol procedures, we no longer need this gadget, this little spittoon there. And patients are very comfortable. If the suction is effective, we just don't need the spittoon. So what did we do? You're right. We put cling film on all of that. And then it one day struck me that if we are never ever going to use these spittoons, one day when we want to use it, maybe I don't know if ever it will happen. I don't think I will ever use spittoons ever, even if all these restrictions are lifted, even if the aerosols are no longer a threat. I probably, I just told them, just keep it going. 
once a week we remove the cling film and we just uh, run water through it to prevent it from clogging and kind of getting spoiled as if by just by not using so we don't do actual fogging to tell you the truth we don't do fogging but but this is chlorine dioxide it has been used for a long time in hospitals we place a sachet of this rapi g gas fumigation sachet we place it in water and at the end of the day in the, at the end of the day we place it in water and then and let it fill the room we close the windows fill the and let it fill the room this gas whichever comes out from this the room is not entered into for two hours and the windows and after two hours what we do is we open up the windows and we open it up for ventilation after two hours for about 15 minutes so we close all the doors we close the windows we open up this gas fumigation sachet do the needful and after two hours open it up and ventilate the room there's also a similar tablet it's called chlori tab it comes in tablet form and it does the same thing and now moving on to something which interests everybody personal protective equipment this is a subject we now it has become something it has become a part of our life and we don't know what all things we are going to do with it are we going to breathe through it are we going to do yoga through it whatever it is it is here because we are now going to have to use it all the time so the day begins we come in in our kind of plain clothes i have to dump all my sarees they're all they're all like lying wasted in the cloth in, in my house and i have to come and use we have like everybody else in the clinic we all have to we all get into scrubs and this is the this is the list of things you can see inside that folder which you which you can see on your left the pink folder this is the folder with the pink thing that is our reusable uh, isolation gown then we have i have a footwear which may or may not or may not use i have the visor we have a surgical mask and of course the n95 mask so we use all of this if we are treating a patient i like to use the n95 and on top of that i put my surgical mask so that I, so that i could use my n95 mask again and again at least as per the requirements so we found that it was making a big mess all these masks all these uh, isolation gowns and along with their visors so we labeled them for all the doctors that are there and put them into these little file folders the and to make it appear a little bit neater and so that they could easily find their equipment the person their and all their gear before they when they came in at the beginning of the day the other big sad thing if you would call it that is that i know now for some time conferences are not going to happen so i converted my conference room to a place where we could keep all of this gear for the nurses i am in the process of buying a similar folders for these people so you can see that we said if to every nurse each chair is like your home this is like the place where you keep all your gear and i'm going to buy you folders and slowly we we'll find a place to stack all of that but right now my conference room is doing the job of just segregating all this and making it neat and clean until such time as we are able to find a place for this so everyone changes into scrubs in the clinic on arrival and in change back at the end of the day into plain clothes these shoes which you see they are worn only in the clinic i have already said that there are staff then of course you know everybody doesn't have to wear the full equipment there are staff who are not exposed to patients for them this is fine we have a circulating doctor we don't really do a lot of counseling with all that ppe on while the patient is in the room and we we have a circulating doctor who does all the counseling who writes the prescription who gives everything who tells all the details because the patients want to ask for so many questions and there are some nurses who are not assisting inside with the doctors for them whatever these people are wearing this is fine this is what they have to use if they ever go near a patient they have to get into the full Uh, full full ppe equipment and then and having done all of that the day comes to an end finally so all the scrubs are uh, discarded into one put into one place the isolation gowns are also segregated they are laundered separately with soap and water the reusable gowns are folded into the folders for the purpose and the scrubs iron and we are ready to start the next day So, Dr. Ayer, I'm going to take over, and I think uh, Dr. Acharya can turn off her webcam, right? Yes, you can have yours on. All right, perfect.
That was a great start. I'm not sure. One second. Ah, there we go. My webcam has like a privacy screen. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. All right. So let me just get back to it. Okay, so you can see me and you can hear me and you can see the presentation? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. So thank you again, Dr. Ayer, for giving us this opportunity. It's great to be back on your platform. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be associated with you and your team for so many years. And thanks for that introduction. And you know, I'm just gonna pick up exactly where she left off. So the day ends. But before we talk about the next part about what kind of PPE we need and what we're doing, I think it's important to sort of let's talk about the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room is of course is covid airborne or not uh dr Ayer, i'm just trying to get my webcam view as well um always I'm in the sure. front so you need to just uh minimize yeah, your screen it is always yeah, in the front and, and uh it's fine i'll just ignore it Okay, as long as uh, you can see the presentation, that's fine. We can so see you COVID, as well. Okay, perfect. Is COVID airborne or not? So this is a question which we've been asking. We've seen lots of reports in the newspaper, and these questions keep coming up with WhatsApp forwards and everything, and really the distinction is this. You have the virus, and it's in a droplet. And if that droplet is greater than 5 micrometers, and this is what everyone has basically agreed upon at this point, it's bigger than five micrometers, it's called a large droplet, and supposedly that just falls harmlessly a few maybe inches from the patient at best. And if it's a very small uh, particle, if it's a droplet nuclei, it's less than five micrometers, and then there's a good chance that this is going to travel a long distance. And that's really what the debate is all about. That's what we're debating. So look at all these new news articles, right? You must have all heard this thing where 230 scientists and remember, scientists, they didn't really say doctors, they said scientists. 230 scientists have written to uh, the WHO and demanded why they are not classifying it as airborne. The WHO has been bullied a lot during this pandemic and they have flip-flopped from one side to the, to the other. So they have basically said there's emerging evidence of airborne transmission. The New York Times has reported on it. And in our very own WhatsApp group, AID family, we got this. Big breaking, COVID-19 is confirmed as airborne and remains in the air for eight hours. So everyone is required to wear a mask everywhere. So I read that and I was like, wait, CNBC had a sort of caption like that? That's unbelievable. And then I realized that the big breaking part and the COVID-19 is confirmed as airborne part was all done by some illustrious WhatsApp scholar, right? So the actual quote at that point when, the, when this letter was written, the WHO said, the possibility of airborne transmission in public settings in very specific conditions, which is crowded, closed, poorly ventilated settings have been described but cannot be ruled out. So what I don't get now is why everyone is freaking out, because we already knew this. We were wearing masks, we had small enclosed rooms, which were a problem. And if that droplet is five micrometers or less than five micrometers, as if it's reaching you, I you know, I don't understand what is the big concern of if it's airborne or not because the who has basically said we're going to appease these guys who are prompting us to say that it's airborne but essentially we are not really changing what we're doing right let's look at the evidence so times of india of course loves to report and they say things you should know avoid going to the appointment of your dentist unless it's urgent so of course times of india are not making the situation any easier so this was from a paper which basically describes how it's done. You can have particles which are atomized and they become aerosols, which is less than five micrometers. And then someone breathes it or the droplets which just fall harmlessly to the ground. So then WHO finally, I think it was yesterday, and they, they came and said, in these specific conditions, airborne transmission is a problem. Endotracheal intubation, bronchoscopy, open suctioning, administration of nebulized treatment, manual ventilation before intubation, turning the patient to the prone position. Remember, these are known COVID patients. Disconnecting a patient from a ventilator, any non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, tracheostomy and cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So I looked at all those words and I was like, those words don't matter to me except open suctioning. I'm like, is in dentistry, are we doing open suctioning? So I went and researched what that's all about. So what is open suctioning? It has nothing to do with the suctioning we do in dentistry. Open suctioning is basically a person's on a ventilator and you want to 
remove all of the mucus in the respiratory system. You take them off the ventilator, you would take a suction tube and feed it deep inside all the way up to the trachea and suck everything out. Versus closed suctioning, where you can introduce the suction catheter into the airway and you don't have to disconnect the patient from the ventilator. So it's considered a very safer thing to do. So this has nothing to do with our oral cavity suctioning. It's totally different, right? So with the WHO's definition currently of airborne transmission risk, we don't come under the risk category at all. And what are the considerations leading, leading me to my decision of how we are practicing, right? Let's look at a couple of things. Viral sampling and culture, reproduction rate, quality of evidence. This was a study from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. It was a preprint study, which means it's not yet been peer reviewed. But it makes it interesting nonetheless. And what they did was, I just described this, you guys don't need to read the text, but essentially there are patients in the rooms, they are COVID positive, they may be coughing, they're not wearing a mask, and now they have an air sampler in the room. And also they now have a technician come in and sample the air in the room, swap the cell phone, swap the toilet, swap the glasses, swap the laptop, swap the exercise equipment, and see how much viral RNA is present. Remember, this is the room of a COVID positive patient. So when they did all of that for this group, 81.3% positive samples. For the cell phones of these patients, 83.3%, you would expect this. And the toilets also had 81% positive samples. But now here's what you need to see. The second block of text here, Air positive, air samples were positive and they were examined for viral propagation. What does that mean? They were taking the RNA of the virus and putting it in a culture medium and seeing if it grows. And the cytopathic effect was not observed in any sample to date, which means they may have just been catching dead virus. So when you do an RT-PCR, which is the test which we're using to diagnose COVID, what happens is they are only testing for the presence of viral RNA. We are not testing whether it's infective, we are not testing whether it's dead or alive, or what effects it's gonna have. So this study, even though it's a preprint study, is interesting that they were not able to grow the virus from any of the samples in the room of a COVID positive patient. So that speaks a lot. So I said, okay, you know, I need to be suspicious because this is a preprint study, it's not really evidence, should I talk about it? So I said, let's go back. Let's go back to SARS-CoV-1 or the original SARS. So in this one, they had an air sampler in the room, and I'm just going to read from this. The, the three hours the air sampler was operating in the room, the patient was not wearing a mask, they were coughing periodically, they walked about, and they were told to stay five feet away from the air sampler. That's the blue thing which you see on the right. And even the air of the corridor in the critical care unit was also tested. And finally, they were all analyzed, of course, for culture and the swabs were culture negative. If you look over here, positively with the PCR, but culture negative. So what does that mean? When patients cough or sneeze, they expel respiratory droplets, and this can travel several meters, as we know. But the evaporation leads to droplet nuclei. Remember, we're talking less than five micrometers, and that is transportable by air currents, but this drying process, and this is a very, very critical point of this, the drying process may reduce the infectivity and that's why we're not able to culture it. My second conclusion about you know what is, is this airborne or not is the reproduction rate. What is the reproduction rate? You might have heard it. Reproduction rate basically means how many uh, people if one person gets the disease how many people is he or she going to spread it to. So hepatitis C has two, measles has 18. So let's look at SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 has 2.24 to 3.58 been slightly upgraded to 3.58 and the seasonal flu the one which we get every year is about 1.1 to 2.3 measles on the other hand is 12 to 14 percent 12 to 14 people that means measles is seven times more uh, infective than SARS-CoV-2 we don't see a lot of measles cases because all of us are vaccinated our kids are vaccinated so that's not a problem but look at chickenpox. Chickenpox seems to be, hey, you know, SARS-CoV-2 upper limit is 3.58, chickenpox is 3.7. It's getting kind of close and chickenpox is a confirmed airborne disease just like measles. So I started looking into that and I was like, chickenpox is, you know, maybe, maybe we're looking at this wrong. Maybe it is airborne. Then I looked at the study which was referenced. This study was a study in Norway and they basically say, the basic reproduction number of varicella, which is the virus that causes chickenpox, is 3.7 to 5.0. 
and it is a low number in Norway because of vaccination. The vaccination will reduce the R0 number. So please keep that in mind when you're looking at it. So then I know it's not scientific to go to Wikipedia for any kind of evidence, but I had to do it because this had a nice little table and the references are all given for you to see and the source is there. But measles are not 12 to 18 in a country other than Norway. It seems like chickenpox has 10 to 12. And this is airborne transmission. No one has to cough or sneeze just by the breath. You can have uh, chickenpox transmitting and that's why it's so contagious. And SARS-CoV-2 is down to 3.28. So please tell me if you guys still think that if a disease is truly airborne, why aren't we seeing a reproduction rate of even 10 or 12 or 15 or 18 or even more? If it was actually airborne, we should be seeing actually seven to eight times the number of cases which we are actually seeing right now. And that isn't happening. And if you compare uh, SARS-CoV-2 with the original SARS, SARS was two to three in the early months, and then they did control measures for the original SARS and it dropped down to about 1.1. And SARS-CoV-2 is 2.7. I also don't like the quality of evidence which is coming out with the airborne study. So this uh, this person is the lead author of the letter which went to uh, the WHO. And if you notice, they're you know, not in medical journals. They are in environment journals and air quality journals. And if you look at the list of people who wrote that article, you know, it's let's come to that. But I want to talk about one of the ways or one of the papers which was cited as you know, being evidence of airborne spread of, uh, this was the original SARS. So this was written in 2004. So follow this diagram over here and you can see building E. And building E is where the original patient visited unit number seven on March 14th, again on March 19th. And this was a case in Hong Kong where an entire cluster of buildings, they all developed SARS, the original SARS virus and it was suspected that it was airborne. And so there were a lot of studies trying to explain how is it possible when there was an index patient in March 14th, and then he again visited March 19th to use the toilet, and then clusters started forming everywhere. Please look at their reasoning. So the Air Force simulations support the spread of airborne SARS virus. So someone, virus-laden aerosols in the vertical stack of unit seven, in the dried up, it went through the dried up seals of the flow drain traps. It entered the air shaft by means of a suction created by an exhaust fan. The virus laden aerosols then moved up because of the buoyancy of the warm, humid air. It entered another air shaft and then it went to, I think, another air shaft and then the upper, upper floors of the building. And then, because of negative pressure, was pulled to all the other buildings. Basically, they're saying that this virus is going everywhere because of the wind currents and, you know, the, the exhaust fans and all of the ventilation system in buildings. If COVID was truly airborne, do you think that, don't you think by now that all of India would be affected? You know, because we have a lot of closed ventilation systems or even the whole world would be affected if such was the spread of COVID. I would believe this for measles. I do not believe this for SARS. I don't really believe this for COVID either. And this was the paper, which basically said most of the chemists, engineers, and owners of ventilation companies are the ones who have written this letter of 200 something, 200 scientists to the WHO. They do not have a broad understanding of disease transmission mechanisms. And the issue is more nuanced than any of them realize. And I agree with this. This is actually something which you guys should read. It's a great paper to read. So to solve the debate, is it airborne? Is it droplet? Well, it's possibly airborne for short distances, like the WHO said. But the evidence of infectivity through the airborne route is currently very poor and culture and reproduction rates do not support this conclusion. And for the, for the biggest sort of evidence for us dentists, there's been no COVID-19 hotspot identified in the dental office worldwide. If airborne was such a problem, don't you think that we would have seen this for sure? <coughs> So that comes to the next topic, suction units. The suction units we have are the biggest weapon we have against any kind of aeros aerosolization. We want to be extra cautious. So we want to make sure, you know, just in case we're wrong, suction units are fantastic. And they're really high volume evacuation and saliva ejectors. And what we need to pay attention to is the high volume evacuation. So this is a test and the studies have shown that the HVE can reduce 90 to 98% of aerosols regardless of the source. 
And if you take a look, what we did, you know, we have we have seen, I've not been able to find the paper, but the basic goal is to suction one liter of water in one minute. And I suggest you guys do this test in your clinic as well, where you are suctioning this quantity of water. So here's the video. And you can see that we have started the timer. It started from 60 and it's counting down. And you need to have a wide bore suction. Please don't use the narrow surgical tips. You need to have the wide bore suction. And you can see it finishes it in about 14 seconds. If you notice at the start of the video, actually, you can see that I have the saliva ejector on. Why am I doing that? If I had the saliva ejector off, that suction would have taken about 10 seconds. But because we are going to be using both at the same time with the patient, it's better to have the saliva ejector on and then test your high volume evacuation to see that it falls within a minute. Really our target, because I'm not able to find the specific paper of how long or how fast it should do, we are targeting 30 seconds for all of our chairs. And that requires an investment, unfortunately, possibly new suction motors. And also you need to train your assistant in how exactly they need to hold the high volume suction because many of them are unfamiliar. So they need to follow your high speed and they need to make sure that they're keeping pace with you so that they are able to suction out all of any type of aerosol which may be emanating. But 90 to 98% of it is taken doing this. And even if I'm changing my position, the assistant needs to be aware and make those adjustments accordingly. So this is our PPE. No, I'm just kidding. But a lot of the PPE which we've seen, which has been uh, especially shown off on social media is like this. But I'm going to talk to you about our PPE. But before that, the donning and doffing is very important, as you guys have heard. This was adapted from the New York Presbyterian uh, Wild Common Medicine uh, Hospital. And we essentially photoshopped it and we changed it around to make it work for us because you may have different components of your PPE and a stock sort of arrangement doesn't really work so well for everyone. So we modified it and we, we sort of uh, made this available and we stuck it around the clinic so no one makes a mistake. The coveralls which we're using is made out of taffeta material. Taffeta is the same thing which is used to make an umbrella. So it is water resistant. I wouldn't say it is 100% waterproof. It does get kind of damp, but it dries extremely fast. So even if you drench this entire thing in about 15 minutes, the it's dry. We don't like the ones like the you know the coverall, not the coverall. It's like a jumpsuit. We don't like that kind of design. It's a bit uncomfortable. I will say that the first time I wore this, I felt it was hot because I was used to just wearing you know normal clothes. But then the second day, I just got so used to it. It doesn't even really bother me anymore that it's there. This outfit has the, the shirt component of it and it's, it's buttoned up or you could have Velcro and it has like basically the pants part of it. And it's, there's even a hood you can see here, Dr. Mahesh is wearing his hood and there's the face sheet, which I'm going to go into. Later versions of this, we also said, why not? Let's just make a shoe cover with this. So later versions of this outfit is also shoe cover. This material is cheap. You can get 100 meters of taffeta material for uh, about 4,000 rupees. And you can stitch about 25 to 30 suits with that. And your tailor's gonna probably charge you 500 rupees to stitch a suit. So you, you should tell them to make the sleeves a little bit long so that you can stuff it into the gloves. And this is a material which we really like. And you might say, why am I not using something which is impenetrable? I told you it's water resistance, not waterproof, but why am I not using that? Because of this study. So they tested, the infectivity of the virus, not the presence only. This is the original SARS again. They tested how infective it's on paper, on cotton, and on these disposable gowns, which are impenetrable, these synthetic ones, which uh, we, we call as non-woven materials, right? Or even a plastic material, which I've seen, which is extremely uncomfortable because you can't breathe in them. So in, these, in this study, they inoculated the, uh, the samples, the paper, the cotton, or the, the gowns with the virus. And they, they did it with 10 power 4 inoculus of the virus. And this is much higher than your typical nasopharyngeal aspirate, which is just 10 2.2. And within five minutes on the paper, it dried up. The virus was no longer infected. On the disposable gown, it took one hour. And on the cotton gown, it only took five minutes. 
So that tells you that the disposable gown, because it is completely waterproof, is allowing the droplet to still sit and still be a droplet containing a viable virus. Whereas, you know, the, the, the cotton gown, the, the droplet sits, it gets absorbed, it's dried, and the virus is no longer infected. So the disposable gown took one hour versus the cotton gown, it just took five minutes. And then as they increased the viral load, it took longer with all three of these samples. So the present data shows that an ordinary cotton gown, gown gives reasonable protection against small droplets containing SARS-CoV. And our study also raises the possibility that any droplets that hang on a non-absorbent disposable gown may pose a risk of contaminating the environment. So donning and doffing with a non-absorbent gown, which a lot of you may be wearing, is actually riskier for you and for the environment because the droplets may still be there on the gown. They've not been absorbed. The second thing we were testing is the canvas type material. And the canvas type material is, uh, you know, something which is, uh, we experimented the, in the early days and we got this and it comes with these tapes which seal off the seam and that's how you get uh, Citra certified. And what we found was, and we were told that we can do, we can use this for about 25 washes. And about after two, three washes, you can see my left arm doesn't have the blue tape anymore and the right arm has the blue tape still. That's because it came off in the wash. I'm not particularly concerned. These are also very comfortable gowns. If you're not sold on the idea of, um, you know, the, the absorbent gowns, then this is a non-absorbent gown, which doesn't allow water to penetrate. But we are using this less and less. I can also tell you that the shoe covers down there, which you see, they you need to really tie them tight. Sometimes you may be cutting off circulation to your legs because if you don't tie them tight, they tend to fall off. The face shields we are using are these, and the face shields are, you know, we have a couple of versions because different heads, different sizes, etc. But let's look at a study. This was a great study. They had a cough simulator and they had a breathing simulator with a face shield and without a face shield, and then they analyzed the droplets. So the use of face shields can substantially reduce the short-term exposure of healthcare workers to the larger aerosol particles, but smaller particles cannot be protected by the face shield and that's why we still wear masks. That's why we still wear respiratory protection. Another paper which compares, which compares all of these uh, various options, this was a poster actually, and they found that the full face shield plus the N95 or a filtering face piece respirator, if you like to call it that, was the best and the most effective versus just a face shield without a mask or a combination or just safety eyeglasses and an N95. You may say, I don't like the face shield. It's fogging. It's irritating. Let me just wear my N95 and let me wear these goggles. It's not going to be good enough. Okay. And studies have shown us that. So if we look at the three face shields over here, these are the three designs we have tested. Actually, we've tested a lot more. The one on the left is very, 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 very flimsy. You probably get a couple of wears with it and you're going to have to throw it away. So it's just like, it's just too, it's too weak. It's not great. Difficult to clean also. This one in the middle is what most of the dental assistants use. Uh, myself, Dr. Acharya, some of our doctors, some of our dental assistants use this guy on top. The reason why I like this, this is by a company called Blue Eagle and it's, it's available across India and the world. It's made in Taiwan. And the reason I like it is this little head strap on top because what we've found is if your face shield only covers the head circumference and you need to make it tight to stabilize it that pressure of the face shield can cause headaches and can cause problems but this uh the one with the yellow one which has this little strap on top that is useful because it sits on your head like this and that acts as a support so that's why i like that face shield some other face shields which you've tested i did not like this design on the left because it seems to be fine for this nurse but the problem is it's not long enough for some nurse. If we go back, you can see all of these other face shields are pretty long, but this one is actually pretty short. She's wearing it quite close, so it looks okay. For a lot of nurses, it didn't work. This one got a big thumbs down. And I don't like this design as well. It's actually pretty comfortable. It's very light, but I don't like the fact that it fans out. If I have a patient here and I'm working, that fanning out is a problem because I feel you can have droplets easily enter and it's not giving me the protection that I need. Fogging is a big problem, and this might be the only um, episode in the history of humanity where a WhatsApp forward has been useful, because this I learned from a WhatsApp forward. And basically, if you have fogging of a face shield, you use regular 
liquid soap. You know, this is after you've disinfected your face shield with hydrochloride the previous day. Use regular liquid soap and you wipe this down. And the very important part is you do not wash that soap off, you wipe it off. So now there's a thin layer of soap which is reducing the surface tension and it prevents fogging. And this has worked pretty well. So that's that's a nice thing to have. Dr. Ayer, if you want to interrupt for questions uh, for stuff which we've already covered, I, I think you can. Or would you like me to continue? Okay. No, I think let's look at some of the questions that have been uh, posed so far. Uh, not too many, though. We talked about the dilution for uh, Acrocept tablets. That was one so of the questions. Yeah, so that's on the that's uh, it's on the box. It tells you how many tablets for what purpose. So I mean, it's like I think it's like four tabs a liter or something like that. And what is your uh, pulse oximeter uh, reading that you accept when you see patients? So we don't accept below ninety four. Below below ninety four, uh, you know, we irrespective of the age of the patient, below ninety four, we say that you know this may be uh, some kind of uh, something which you need to look at, but we we basically don't allow those patients into the practice. And for temperature, anything above 99 Fahrenheit, we don't allow. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. We can continue. So there is a problem with loops. Uh, loops, especially like this one, which have that little uh, sort of uh, filter so that you don't cure the composite. That holds up the face shield and the face shield doesn't clean close fully. So in my loops, these are designed for vision. I had to unscrew that little filter so that it closes fully. And that was uh, useful to get a proper patient. Now, my favorite topic, respirators and masks. So first things first, if anyone in your practice or a patient or anyone is wearing this type of mask, not the fact that it's KN95 really, but the fact that it has a valve, do not allow them in. This valve does not filter out exhaled air. It's there for the purpose of, let's say you're a painter or you're removing asbestos. You have these valves so that you can breathe out freely because it doesn't matter what you're breathing out in an industrial environment. But in a medical environment, you cannot have this type of valve. A lot of people confuse this valve and they say, oh, I have a mask with a respirator. That's not true. They're all respirators, but this is a respirator with a valve. So do not use the valve model. And if you look at a typical N95 mask, we call it the N95. It's actually a disposable filtering face piece. N95 is easier to say. The similar word for that is the FFP2, which is your uh, European standard, and others, KN95 and various ones. So they'll have a lot of model numbers, markings, lot numbers. This is what an original one looks like. And if we are to differentiate, a surgical mask is to help prevent biological particles from being expelled by the wearer into the environment. But the respirator is designed to protect the wearer from airborne particles. Now, very, very important. And a lot of people don't know this, but to have a successful N95, you need to do something called a fit test. And I would say 99.9% .9 of us practicing in India, we have not had the opportunity to do a fit test because there's no one doing it. And you also need to do something called a user seat check. So what are these two things? So the fit test, a trained person is going to come and they're going to put this big sort of hood on top of you while you're wearing a mask. And they're going to have a chemical agent which they will introduce and if you can taste or smell that agent then your n95 has failed the fit test so that is something which is very important and let's look at the statistics of that the qualitative fit testing is used and there's also quantitative fit, fit testing so it's something that smells like bananas or it's a little bit sweet or it's bitter or it causes coughing if they can if these are the four methods that are accepted by the OSHA. So if any of these are tasted or smelled by the patient, it's a fit test fail. And the quantitative way is used generally when you use these full face respirators, you know, the gas masks as we call them. But these are more quantitative. They have machinery to actually test whether you failed or passed the fit test. It's not reliant on the subject. So it's obviously a better way to test. Donning the N95 is very, very important. And you hold the mask like this, how the lady is showing, you cup and then you put the two straps and do not crisscross the straps. You need to do it. And then you need to do a user self check, a seal check, which basically means the N95 is on. You place your hands on top of your mask and then you breathe out. 
if you feel the mask breathe it move a little bit then that's a positive that's a good sign that means there's a good seal and that's why the mask is moving and when you take a deep breath you're doing a negative seal check and you want the mask to feel like it's coming in just a little bit it'll be like a millimeter but that's the exact way you want it to be you want it to come in so a lot of people are not doing user seal checks a lot of people are not doing fit tests so really what good is the n95 and if we look at the comparison of these two on the left side is something which is what we would not really call a legitimate product because it says N95 Magnum FFP2. It has all the certifications possible to make you buy it. I also found that this strap is sort of a cotton strap and it is comfortable, but it just didn't make the mask tight enough. Whereas this one is an original 3M N95 or an FFP2 in this case, and it's bought directly from 3M. So you need to be careful if you're wearing these don't wear fake stuff because you don't know what goes into it and it's most likely not going to be any better than just using a simple surgical mask the one we originally got were manufactured by venus this was a reputable company it's in Maharashtra, i believe but this had a lot of earache because if you compare this this has two loops one goes on the back of the head the other goes to the below the ears and on the neck but in this model because it's only this loop on the left and the right it has to go over the ears and this creates a lot of problem. So we are using these ear guards, which I've talked about before, or these ear savers, which we originally 3D printed and then replicated in plastic. But all of my staff are now using this so that they don't have pain. And as you can see, we are wearing the, uh, the filtering face piece inside and then a surgical mask on top of it. And here's the thing. I, I, I possibly scared you guys about the fit testing. So let's see if someone has not been trained on N95 usage and they've not been fit tested, how many of them actually pass or fail the actual fit testing? 55.8%. That means half of you listening to this webinar will fail tomorrow if a fit testing was done for you. So that's something to really, really keep in mind. So the effectiveness of these N95s is really surprising. And even after training, there's 25% failure. And only when there are tailored respirators from 3M or whatever company is making these respirators did it drop down to 0%. And they were even reminded, but there were still failures. You can see those numbers later. How are we sterilizing our N95? We're using the famous rice cooker method. And a rice cooker costs you something like 2,000 rupees. This has been validated by evidence, which you can see at the bottom of the page. But our protocol is this. We are allowed to, according to the literature, heat this three times so we said let's just heat it twice because once you heat it more than three times the the permeability of the mask increases too much potentially letting viral particles in so you use for day one about four to six hours we sterilize it takes three minutes to heat the rice cooker automatically turns off we wait for it to cool for five minutes and put it in an open paper bag then we use it for day two another four to six minutes again sterilize and then we finally use it on day three, another four to six minutes, and then we finally discard. Uh, Dr. Ayer, I've emailed you the handouts, by the way. Whenever uh, you feel comfortable, you can distribute it uh, to the attendees. Yeah. And then uh, okay. you should, I will you should pass have it on. Yeah. Sure. And then they, they evaluated the uh, effectiveness of these uh, decontamination methods. And if you look at the graph, they compared the rice cooker, autoclave, ethanol, uh, IPA, and bleach. And if you look at this graph over here, the rice cooker method actually worked the best. The drying heat in a rice cooker had little effect on penetration of particles. That's good news. That means you're now disinfecting and the penetration didn't change. And the results indicate that decontamination increased the penetration of the 75 and 300 nanometer particles, except when they use a rice cooker and an autoclave. So that's why we like the rice cooker. It seems it's easy and it's, it's just done by everyone. What may you may be hearing more is this Bellus 3D Face app. You guys can download it on your iPhone right away or on your Android. You need a device, but any iPhone does just face scanning. It scans your face and you can 3D print a sort of framework which makes a mask fit tighter. So this is a way to achieve a good seal. Anecdotal evidence, what I've seen online, a lot of people are sharing that once they do this on their level three mask, that means an N95 or an FFP2, once they do this on that mask, they have not failed um, a test. 
an objective test. They have not failed it when they have gone for fit test in the N95 mask as long as they have this because this completely seals off the mask from anything from entering. So this is, I think, a lot of this is going to be very popular uh, very soon. I have tried this with a regular surgical mask. It seems to work, but then I notice a lot of moisture build up at the end of the day, and we know that when moisture is there, it's not too effective. I have been on a big adventure to try and solve the, the pressure spots on my nose bridge. Some of my employees have it, some of us don't. Uh, but I've had a big problem. My dermatologist recommended this Sika Care, which is a scarring gel treatment. And you can see in this video here, after I've worn it, there's no sound in this video, but you can see that after I've worn it for, a, for about four hours or so, you can see that the scarring is substantially less. However, There's a problem. Whenever I wore this, I could always feel that air escaping on the top with this solution. So what I'm using now is the little leather which comes in your sunglass case. I'm kind of folding that over and I'm placing my N95 on top of it. And this is not as good as that Sika Care sheet, but at least I don't feel the seal disturbed and it doesn't hurt as much. So we're still kind of figuring out how to deal with the with the nose bridge problem. And now, the things we are not doing. These are all the things we are doing. This is what you've heard. I forgot to mention that we are double gloving. And we are double gloving only because it is easier to take off that glove. And if for some reason you need to leave the room, we would just use hand sanitizer on those gloves. Because using a lot of hand sanitizer on your hands, some of you might be feeling that effect. But you may be developing some rashes or other skin problems. So at least we are hand sanitizing the inner glove and not the outer glove. And that's something which uh, we want to continue doing. We are not so concerned that we are not doing the double gloving because of the coronavirus. We are doing the double gloving because of the, the excessive need for hand sanitizing and it's just easier to doff the PPE, which we're doing very carefully, of course, and we, we with that inner pair of gloves so that we're not touching the actual PPE. So the things we're not doing may be more exciting than what we are doing because we get so many WhatsApp forwards, so many emails, so many salesmen, and it's just... It's just, uh, I mean, interesting and fun in its own way. So this thing, this half or full face respirators, it's more comfortable. The filters and cartridges can be tame and we can be wiped clean, but I have concerns. It's very difficult to communicate. It sounds very sort of metallic behind this. People are comfortable, but my big issue is my loops don't fit. If my loops don't fit, I'm going home. I'm, I'm not doing dentistry. That's the end of it. I need my loops to see what I'm doing. So the loops don't fit with these because they're too big. Maybe a smaller model could have worked, but that's not the reason I'm not using them. The big problem with these half or full face respirators is the exhaled air is not filtered. And if the exhaled air is not filtered, then we have a problem because we are now, we could be asymptomatic carriers. There was, a, there was an incident where we found out that a patient who was about to enter the clinic, she didn't enter the clinic yet, but she got a phone call at that time saying that she has been tested for COVID and that she's positive, but she's totally asymptomatic. So we ourselves could be asymptomatic carriers. Who knows, right, until we test. But if that exhaled air is not filtered and now we are over a patient, the patient's mouth is open and, you know, they, they don't have a mask on because you're doing dentistry on them. And now it's about two hours or, or, you know, an hour and a half of work and you're breathing your exhaled air and you're an asymptomatic carrier that becomes very concerning for me. So I cannot use this. I have seen people, this doctor was very kind to allow me to use this picture, but here you can see that she's used the, what, what they would call the head cap, the bouffant cap, and they've covered the filters with, with, with this. Does this help? There's no evidence to show that this helps. And you know, it just, again, communication is, is a major part of dentistry. And if communication is not happening, then, you know, I don't know the quality of dentistry we can. I find my practice is 90% talking and 10% doing the actual work. So for me, communication is critical. UV sterilization. You guys have heard this, of course. This is a UV box. You're getting uh, marketed right, left, and center. Put your cell phones in, your glasses, your watches, your mask, your keys, everything. Everything's going to get sterilized. How is it applicable in our dental practice? You can see that this practice has a bunch of UV lights all around. But here's the problem. If you want UV to work, it is based on the intensity of the UV light and the fact that the UV light actually 
reaches the surface or the area where the virus is. So this is something which is pretty cool. This is uh, from UVD Robots, I believe it's a Danish company. And you can see what they do for infection control. So you can see it's a robot which has a bunch of UV lights and it's moving all around the room autonomously. And this UV light is going to be um, getting everywhere in the room potentially because of this autonomous robot. There's no one in the room because remember UVC is very, very dangerous. So this solution is obviously not going to be cheap and this is not something which we can, we can afford for our practices. And then you're getting calls saying, hey, you know, you want UV lights for your home. Keep it in your bedroom. Keep it in one corner. Leave the room. Take the remote control and turn it on. Now I have a four-year-old daughter, and you know my my the people who work at home, the domestic help may not understand the instructions. Just what if one fine day we forget about Corona, we forget about this UV, and we've been turning on this UV light, and a kid or a family member enters the room and they look straight at the light because of course it's a blue light. You want to see it? Then you know you can cause permanent retinal damage. And of course, it can cause skin cancers as well. So for the home, UV, no way. Touchless faucets are an option. We've not yet done this because we've just seen in airports and everywhere that these things break down a lot. We may consider foot control faucets so that you have less touch of the faucets themselves. There's also a study which says that copper is a better material for these faucets because the virus dies in four hours on copper. But are your taps being used only every four hours? So does that really matter? Because your taps are probably going to be used at least every 10 minutes or at least every half an hour, but not four hours. So there's a reason we are not considering copper, but foot controlled uh, faucets we may consider. And air purifier is my favorite topic. Why don't we have them in every office? You saw we had them at the reception, but we found difficulties in placing them in an ideal location. We are worried that, you know, you have to have it in a certain location so that it takes the, the potential aerosols away from you and the patient and the assistant. But we found that, you know, we didn't have plug points in the right location. And yes, you can say you can put extension cords and extend it and put your air purifier there. Then we have problems with patients and assistants and doctors tripping over those wires. So that's an issue. All the models in India are household models. And when I talk to the company and I say, hey, you know, your website says that this is the commercial hospital one. He says, no, sir, this is the one which is fast moving in India. Everyone's buying this, so that's why I should buy it. I have concerns as to how efficacious these air purifiers are, especially in a dental environment. Dr. Ayer, you spoke about this last time, but ours is a very wet, moist environment in a, in a dental office. And are those air purifiers becoming overly damp? And we know that when air purifiers become damp, they are a problem. So there's the, the concerns about the wet nature of our environment is a problem. So in Dr. Acharya's room over here, I would have to place this air purifier somewhere in this lower left corner where you see the red circle. I don't have a plug point over there. So then I would have to run an extension cord from the other end. Someone's going to trip over it. It's just not something which I can practically do for each and every room. And you guys are going to face the same problem. What about giving patients all these disposable plastic guns? This is, remember that, that uh, pyramid, it's very, very low. Community protective equipment is the least effective. You're going to cause lots of plastic waste. And remember, the cloth doesn't absorb the droplets. So now you have this plastic impervious material, droplets falling on it, and the droplets are now just sitting there. And now the patient at some point is going to remove this, and it could be your assistant's breath who is an asymptomatic carrier or a droplet from the assistant for some reason. And now the patient removes it. So while doffing, there's a bigger risk. So don't give this kind of stuff. Don't give them gloves either because you can just wash your hands and, and you're, you're, you're free of any problems. For air conditioning, we're maintaining at a comfortable uh, temperature, mainly because studies have shown that if you're uncomfortable we while wearing PPE, you're going to make mistakes. Imagine you're sweating, you're wearing a mask, and N95, it's really uncomfortable, your face starts itching, then you start touching your mask, and now you've created a problem. So we maintain it at a comfortable temperature. We are following government regulations and keeping it open. And you can consider something. You can talk to your AC people and say, can we have a sort of piping so that it takes in outdoor air from the outside instead of recirculating the air? It's still going to be a mix of air of the air from the inside and the air from the outside, but it's something which you can do. 
we are considering this, but we are still waiting for real solid evidence about airborne transmission because this requires uh, modifications to the false ceiling. It requires some piping, but surprisingly, it's actually not terribly expensive. So this is something you can consider to increase the amount of fresh air with your air conditioning. These are filters sold by 3M, and they are again not cheap. They are cheap. They're 350, 750, 900 rupees. I spoke to my AC technician. I said, hey, there are these filters. You know, it's really cool. I can have like an air purifier in my AC. He's like, you know, the second you put those filters, the AC is going to work harder, and then you're going to see a lot of water leakage from the AC. So we abandoned this idea as well. There are these two devices, which you may have heard of, where you attach the high volume evacuation. One is Mr. Thirsty. The other one is Isolite. And Isolite is more expensive. Mr. Thirsty is uh, disposable. And, uh, you know, what, what I was really happy about was when I was told that this is autoclavable, that you can reuse Mr. Thirsty again and again because it was not too expensive. It was 600 rupees, and that's not too bad. Isolite is a whole system. You need to invest, I think it is like two or three thousand dollars. I'm not exactly sure. But how this works is the high volume evacuation is attached to the, to the Mr. Thirsty or the Isolite, and that does all the suctioning work. I've used it, it works really well. And, you know, it actually frees up the assistant's hand. That's great. Patients don't complain. Some patients, if their mouth opening is less, you may have a problem. You may use, need to use the pedo size, the smaller size. But it's been fine. But I could not find on the company website or on the packaging that it is autoclavable and reusable. So then, you know, this becomes a difficult product to have. And I still think it's better that this, the assistant holds the high volume uh, suction than connecting it to the Mr. Thirsty. But if you have only, you know, uh, very few assistants or an assistant not available, or you have someone doing hygiene and there's no assistant available for them, then in that case, this may be something which you could consider. COVID testing, a hot topic. Should we be doing COVID testing? Well, there's a problem. It has 44% false negativity. This is straight from the lab. That means essentially half of the patients you send may come up with a false negative. And if there's a false negative and you know the patient you know is COVID negative, or at least you're supposing that it is, now you have a problem of letting your guard down and your staff is going to let their guard down. They're all going to say, hey, it's COVID negative. Let's just relax. You don't have to go crazy. But I want everyone to be on their, on their A game all the time. So because of the high false negativity, and then patients are afraid. They don't want to go to a testing lab. They're worried about the stigma. If they get uh, tested positive, are they going to have their entire building cordoned off? Are they going to have all of those issues happen? So we have not been going, we experimented with it briefly, but there was a lot of sort of resistance from us internally from the patients, so we can actually do it. You may say antibody testing, very fast, very rapid, easy to do. Why not? Recent Cochrane review, which actually spoke about this, I think it just got published a few days ago, but only 70% of people, and they did this only on patients who are in the hospital with known COVID. So even in known COVID patients who had symptoms, antibody testing identified only 70% of them. And so we don't really know. There's not much evidence of how effective it is in asymptomatic carriers. So this type of antibody rapid testing is fine as a general screening tool, but not so much uh, for anything beyond that. So that's why we haven't implemented this either. Fogging machines. We really love the clinic. We don't want to ruin any of the nice upholstery or anything like that. You may say, why not use it with hypochlorous acid? It's just electrolyzed water. We really don't know how to fog effectively. You know, how do you fog this entire room effectively? So we're really just letting the chlorine dioxide tablet do its thing at the end of the day. And we're not really investing in these fogging machines, which are quite loud, difficult to use. Someone has to actually go in and do it. It's just not something which we've been sold on and that's why we haven't gone into it. Negative ion generators. I looked up the study of this negative ion generator and this one was, the way they had conducted the study was very interesting. They had a closed box full of virus particles and the negative ion generator was subjected to only that small squared closed box. And then they showed that the virus particles are now dead because of the negative ion generator. How does that translate into real world dental? There's no evidence. There's nothing to support. If you have read the evidence and you feel that this works for you, great. But for me, for our practice, there's not enough evidence to support this. Aerosol shields, you've seen this also. I feel it's just going to reduce access. And what if your patient is claustrophobic? What if, you know, you, the second you put that box on them, they're going to be like, no, can't do this. So that's something which we haven't considered at all. 
extra oral suction units, hot topics selling for about 50, 60,000 rupees. We feel that it's too loud. As you know, dentists already have a problem with deafness because of our high speed, uh, high frequency sounds, which we all the time. These filters need to be cleaned every few days because it, and it needs to be cleaned by a human being. It's not automated. So you have to take out the filters, you need to wash them. And there's just no compelling evidence that they use. And uh, for me, I'm personally worried that my patient is now reclined and now I have that suction right in front of their face. And now they say, oh, I need to stand up. Now I need to move the suction out of the way, which means contact with that suction unit and then recline the chair. And now I'm touching a lot of things, which is potentially getting contaminated. So extra oral suction units we haven't gone in for. I know other practices have gone in for it. And if it works for you, that's great. And this one I thought was great. This is a portable air sterilization card. What's in it? Nobody knows, but it gives you 360 degree protection from bacteria and virus. What kind? All of it. And it gives you protection for one meter space around you. So this is technology from probably the year 3000. And it gives you this superb protection like a bubble, like a force field. And it gives you continuous protection for 30 days. And it's suitable for everyone, low immunity, uh, children, elderly, and guys, it's Japanese made. So you know that it works, right? So I'll just leave you with that. Please don't, please don't invest in these. So this is our protocol. It's subject to change based on new evidence. You know, this is where the evidence is currently at this time. We would recommend that you all take the effort to read the evidence yourself and make your own decisions. And remember, there's a smile behind the mask and the patients need to remember that as well. And I need to thank all of these fine individuals, starting from Dr. Shankar Rayar, Dr. Prithvi, Dr. Ranita, Dr. Vinam and Rashmi, because we've they have selflessly shared information. Um, you know, a lot of practices are not really sharing information because they feel, oh, I have this PPE vendor, I want to hold on to them, etc. But everything of this presentation has come because people have shared. And I thank them for taking that effort to share and collaborate. And that's what has moved us forward. So thank you all for your time. Very good, Varun. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate the time and the effort. A lot of evidence-based materials. I would like to bring Dr. Uh, Vijayalakshmi Acharya on the camera so we can publicly acknowledge all the efforts. Uh, you both of you have uh, spent a lot of uh, resources, time, effort to make sure that all of your staff are taken care of very well. And I'm sure the patients walking into your practices feel very comfortable and are proud of the fact that uh, somebody's taking care of them. So I hope this is now transmitted a lot of information. So other dentists can benefit from a setting um, not necessarily as opulent and as spacious as yours, but a lot of tips to be uh, shared and a lot of tips to be taken away so that uh, we can reproduce and bring some comfort to the minds and put the minds at ease uh, when the patients are brought to other uh, practices. Uh, the closing words, again, I cannot thank you enough for all of the wonderful efforts. I know you've been close for how long? How long has it been that your office was closed and when did you reopen? It was closed for probably less than two, three weeks, correct? Yeah, it was closed for about uh, one, let's say one month and a week. So five weeks, okay. all of April five and weeks. the end of March. Very good. And now you're back in almost full force, I would say about uh, 60 to 70% capacity. Uh, I'd say our patient inflow is about, let's say, 30% at this point. It was, it was lower when Chennai announces lockdown, it again gets lower. But, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not too bad. It is picking up. Maybe the Times of India article today is going to change everything or not, and it's again going to get lower. But the media is not helping us, and WhatsApp is not helping us at all. They're not looking at the evidence at all. No, somebody has to come out and say this at about time, and I really commend both of you on your efforts to make this public. Uh, there's nothing to hide. It is pure science, and uh, the fact that there has not been any transmission from a dental practice shows and attests to the fact that we are probably the safest place where patients can come to and get their yeah. work done. Uh, so uh, thanks again, Dr. Acharya. Thanks, Varun. Um, Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you. I'm sure there is a lot of handouts that have been uh, posted. It is up for download. And as a rejoinder, next week, it will be on practice management. So now that you have shown us how to effectively practice safely, now we need to get the revenues in. So to build up on this concept of uh, practice management, we are going to have an expert, uh, Mr. Mike Masado, 
who is going to be talking about practicing with some efficiency, a staff driven practice for a productive revenue generating stream. And uh, that's going to be next week. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And the see you Thank in you about now uh, five, 10 minutes for our next webinar, Dr. Uh, Amit Vora. Thank you. Thanks Thank for that. See Thank you. Doc. Take care. Bye.